everybody. Oh, I don't hear anybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Come on, stand to your feet. Hallelujah. And offer God sacrifices of praise and joy. Hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. But can't nobody do me like Jesus. Put your hands together. said can't nobody can't nobody treat me like Jesus Father God we just want to thank you this morning for being a God who's able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that we might ask or think according to that power that worketh in us we thank you Lord for the saving power we thank you for healing power we thank you Lord for the blessing that you have given us and the ones that you are doing to us right now Lord and as we enter into this worship service we ask, Lord, that you would abide with us, keep us, and control our hearts and thoughts and actions and everything that we do. Let it be to your glory and your honor. We pray, Lord, for the messenger. The word will come forth 
we will hear and will obey, and that all things will be done decent in order, because you are an orderly God. Thank you for those who have pressed their way to be here this morning, Lord. We ask you, Lord, to look on those bereaved families all over this church, all over this city, all over this state. Bless them in a mighty way, Lord. Let them know that you are still worthy of praise, even now. And we'll be so careful to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. And when all said and done, we'll say thank you. And we'll say, can't nobody, can't nobody treat us like Jesus. We ask it in Jesus' name. And all of God's children said amen, amen, and amen. Amen. Hymn number 181, Pass Me Not, verses 1, 2, and 4. Amen. Our God is great, and our God is greatly to be praised. Thank God for this day. We have never seen before, realizing once this day is gone, we shall never see it again. This is the day 
that the Lord has made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. It is indeed another day's journey and we are certainly glad about it. Amen. Amen. I thank God for this day and for your presence and participation. And I pray uh, that everything you stand in need of, that God gives it to us uh, as we stand in the spirit of beloved community on this grand and great and beautiful Sunday morning. How are y'all feeling this morning? Y'all all right? All right? Y'all all right? Y'all all right, for real, for real? Y'all, y'all, y'all ain't fooling me. All right, good, good. That there is a couple, couple of things, excuse me, that I want to get out of the way uh, before we move on. Um, one I just found out about, and I'm, I'm feeling some type of way, but I tell y'all about that in a minute. Um, but Mother's Day committee, uh, FMBC women, uh, who are members and are age seventy and older. Uh, and whose birthdays uh, are before May 11th, you are eligible to receive uh, our gift in honor of Mother's Day. It is a nice uh, God bless you gift that we're going to give you. And we ask that you please contact the church office to ensure your uh, membership information is accurate so we can get it to you. And all names must be submitted by Sunday, April the 30th. Uh, Please see or get with Sister Laura Gibbs. Uh, and the chairman of our Mother's Day committee uh, coordinator. Amen? Amen. So we're looking forward to that um, on, um, on Mother's Day. I want to do something real quick um, that I just found out about, and I don't even know if they know about it. Uh, this has been a year in the making. Uh, I don't know, have you all ever heard of a group called Let's see what the name of this group is. This is a Lifetime Achievement Award uh, that is signed by uh, President Biden. Um, and is two, uh, two members of our church. Um, I'm going to read something to you all. Uh, and this is from the White House. Uh, the American story uh, depends not on any one of us, not on some of us, but on all of us. I congratulate you on taking it upon yourselves to contribute to the public good, and I'm proud to present you the President's Lifetime Achievement Award in recognition of your 4,000 hours of service to this great nation. Throughout our country's history, the American story has been strengthened by those who combine an optimism about what can be with resilience to turn the vision into reality. I know I'm not alone in recognizing that those who are willing to step up and volunteer in service of community and of country are essential to the ongoing work of forming our more perfect union. By sharing your time, by sharing your passion, you are helping discover and deliver solutions to the challenges we face. Solutions that we need now more than ever. We are living in a moment that calls for hope and light and love. Hope for our futures light to see our way forward and love for one another. Through your service, you are provided all three. On behalf of the American people, I extend my heartfelt appreciation to you for your volunteer leadership, and I encourage you to continue to answer the call to serve. The country is counting on you. With the grateful recognition Um, The AmeriCorps of the Office of President of the United States honors Margie and Reverend Fred Hill. Surprise, surprise. Come on, we can do better than that. Check it out. Check it out. Look at it, man. You ain't never seen it. You shot for real. Come on, y'all. Come on. Come on. We can do better than that. Amen. And this is 
Bless you, man. Bless you, man. Uh, and this is from the Shields of Faith Foundation Incorporated. Amen. Amen. It's yours. Ain't that your name right there? Yeah, that's you. Amen. <laughs> Come on, let's give Margie and Reverend Fred Hill. Uh, Reverend Fred Hill a hand. Uh, I'm so grateful uh, for their, their service. They ain't new to this. They true to this. Uh, and they just have such a loving heart and commitment to serve. And I'm proud to say I know both of them. Uh, personally, uh, from the desk of President uh, Joe Biden. Amen. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. I was, uh, I was, I was laughing uh, the other day as we move on. Uh, it really ain't funny, but it's kind of funny. Uh, I shouldn't laugh, but it was kind of funny to me. Um, we still get to know each other, all right? Uh, you know, and sometimes my dry humor uh, kind of takes people off guard. This ain't funny, but it is kind of funny. And uh, uh, I was doing a Bible study uh, Wednesday, Travis, and when I was doing Bible study, I kept on saying in three, two years ago, in 2020, a pandemic hit. I kept saying that two years ago, in 2020, a pandemic hit as I was trying to kind of move into my lesson. Uh, and my wife corrected me, and she put on the news feed three exclamation point. Um, and I made, it, it's funny, but it, it, it's kind of not, but I, I couldn't help but laugh. And I said, tongue in cheek, don't you ever correct me in public. Y'all remember saying that? So much so, I went to Reverend Hill the day after, and I said, you do know I was playing, right? He says, yes, it was obvious uh, you was playing, but it wasn't so obvious. Y'all should have saw my uh, emails about, oh, pastor, you shouldn't have uh, reprimanded your wife in public like that. Uh, and when I got over the initial shock, like, you know, get out of my house, you know, that's the first initial shock, like, why are you in my business? But after I got over that, uh, I said, let me let them know that I don't have the guts to reprimand my wife in public or private. <laughs> um, did I tell you about this? I never told you that. Yeah, yeah, they, they was really, uh, you know, you shouldn't have did that. Uh, let me assure y'all, I know we getting to know each other, and y'all think y'all know me, uh, but if you know anything about Gio Lynette Baskerville Carruthers, where you from? She'll tell you in a minute, I'm from Memphis, uh, and I don't play. So please calm down. It's all good. Uh, it was a joke, and if it wasn't a joke, uh, she would have set me straight. Amen? Amen. Let's put our hands together and welcome the music ministry. I'll praise him as they come and lead us into worship. Everybody come to worship this morning. We invite Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our soul longs for. To be overwhelmed by your presence, Lord. Can you just lift your hands? Hallelujah. nothing worth more that could ever come close nothing can compare you're my living hope your presence Lord I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone it's in your presence lord Hold Feel the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts love. 
all for to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Oh, baby, eyes of our heart, 
the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord, Holy as we've come up to this preaching moment we pray that <clears throat> your spirit continue to tabernacle with us for these few fleeting moments that your word can have free course in this space we pray that you give us power well beyond our preparation that you would take these lips of mere mortar clay that it may speak the oracles of God Give me clarity of thought, even precision of speech, and clear my mind that I can tell the truth and the whole truth, <clears throat> nothing but the truth. So help me, God. Whatever you do, do not hold your people hostage for my faults and my failures. Because my faults are many, but your grace is yet sufficient. All that I am, I am because of thee, and all that I am not, I'm not simply because of me. Now let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Continue to be my strength and to be my redeemer. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. John chapter 19. John chapter number 19 and when you find John 19 if you can slide down to verse 28 and there will we shine our sermonic spotlight John chapter 19 verse 28 when you find it if you are able we ask that you rest on your feet John 19 and 28 Reading from the New King James Version, it reads, After this, <clears throat> Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to tag this text briefly. Uh, with the title, Obey Your Thirst. Obey. Obey Your Thirst. <clears throat> the maker, the creator of heaven and earth has parched lips. The Lord of glory <clears throat> is in need of a drink. The only begotten of the Father is thirsty. What a scene. Jesus, the miracle worker himself, is crying out these words. I thirst. 
it is unusual. To many of us, it is even unlikely. It almost reads as a misprint to those of us who have a high Christology, if you will, for this to even be in the Bible. Jesus Christ is saying, I am thirsty. After all, my grandmother used to tell me that he is water when I'm thirsty. But Jesus, who grandmother claims is water when I'm thirsty, is telling me in the text that he's the thirsty one. The old patriarchs and even matriarchs of the pulpit said, uh, he is water in dry places. But Jesus says in our text that I need water. Jesus himself even said on several occasions, like in John 4 and John 6 and John 7, that he was the ultimate thirst quencher. But in John 19, 28, the thirst quencher is thirsty. Jesus cries, I thirst. It sounds like an contradiction. In John chapter 4, verse 14, he told a Samaritan woman while he conversed with her at a well, whoever drinks of the water I shall give him will never thirst but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life, end quote. He sounds so confident and he sounds so sure of himself. He sounds like he knows of his thirst quenching ability in John 4. But in John 19, 28, he says, I thirst. He's water in John 4. He's water in John 6. He's water in John 7. But he is in need of water in John 19. What an oxymoron. In John 19, 28, we have thirsty water. How can it be that the Son of God would be thirsty? How in the world can living water need water? It is a very interesting text we are attempting to dance with today because these words coming off of Jesus' lips offers a very interesting paradigm shift and it's hard not to notice it. Hanging on the cross, Jesus' first words were to his father about forgiveness. When he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Then he speaks to a thief and gives him words of assurance as he says, this day, you would be with me in paradise. And even addresses his mother and his beloved disciple as he hands her over to him. But now he shifts and speaks of what seems to be a mere bodily personal need. I thirst. Jesus here goes instantly from the spiritual, if you will, to the natural. He shifts from the theological to the physical. He says here, while hanging on the cross, not Father, forgive them. Not today you will be with me in paradise. Not into your hands I give my spirit. But he says, 
I am thirsty. It is a shift right before our eyes. It is a shift from his divinity to his humanity. And I must admit, I like this shift, my brothers and sisters. I like this shift because it teaches us a very practical but needed point. It is a strong or it is a strong and specific word to the Christian and to the faith community. This immediate shift serves to teach you and me that even as spiritual and faithful believers in Christ, that we will not always be floating on cloud nine. That life can leave all of us both hanging and thirsty. The example that Christ leaves us with these two sharp and insightful words is that when life leaves you in this condition, it is all right to have certain deficiencies and admit it. It is all right, Christ is teaching us, that when you are hanging and thirsty, when you are hurting and in pain, when you have been the answer to everybody else's questions, that when you find yourself in these parched conditions, it's all right to admit that you are in need. He is the son of God, but he's thirsty. He is the savior of the world, but he's thirsty. You are saved, but you get thirsty. You are favored and you are spiritual and you speak in tongues and you tithe and you may be rich and you may have perfect attendance in church in 2023. But the reality of all of our experiences is that we all have been parched. We all have been thirsty. We all have experienced dry spots in life. Thirsty dry, craving, have an intense desire that you just can't meet at the moment. You can be an usher and thirsty. You can be on the choir and thirsty. You can be a deacon and thirsty. You can be a missionary and thirsty. You can preach every Sunday with a collar on and still be thirsty. And Christ teaches us this morning that the lack of admitting it does not make it any less true. Jesus didn't say, I'm thirsty, but I ain't claiming it. Jesus didn't say, I'm thirsty, but the devil is a liar. Jesus didn't say the enemy trying to make me think I'm thirsty. But Jesus faced reality like we ought to do and acknowledged the fact right now something ain't right. I thirst. Because somewhere along the line, we have been tempted to believe that denial is spiritual. That we've been tempted to believe that if you deny it, it makes it less true. But Jesus teaches us while hanging on the cross in his humanity that I got sleepy, I got tired, I got angry, I got upset, and yes, I even get thirsty. And if Jesus can experience all of those emotions, my brother and my sister, so will you and I. It's three simple, uh, three simple points and, uh, that it teaches us. And when I tell you uh, I'm going to be out of your hair, but I believe you ought to see this in its practicality. This cry, Deacon Simmons, of I thirst was personal. It was personal. There is something I need, Jesus is saying. 
Jesus, while on the cross, offers words of forgiveness for people. He takes time to look out for people. He gives a thief a home in the kingdom. But now he is talking about something he needs. I've seen after the thief. I've seen after my mother. I've taken care of the forgiveness of the sins of the world. But now I want to go to God about something I need. It's personal that there comes a time in all of our lives when we have to go into our prayer closet and address our own needs. That you ain't been selfish when you don't pray for your pray partner this morning. You ain't been selfish if you don't have time to say, God, go to Rwanda and Syria and Kuwait and Afghanistan. Sometimes I ain't got time to send God to where God needs to be. But while on others, they're on calling. Do not pass me by. And every now and then, I ain't got time for prayer preliminaries. You know, this evening, thy heavenly father, here's your poor, weak, humble servant, knee bent, body bound to Mother Earth. I thank God that last night wasn't my last night lying down and that my bed wasn't my cooling board and my sheets wasn't my winding sheets and that you didn't send the death angel to my house and reach up under my eyelids and pour down the blue shades of death. And I'm so glad when I came into the house of the Lord this morning that the door swung open on welcome hinges. It's just good to be in the service one more time. Am I talking to anybody that has ever been so thirsty? Am I talking to anybody that's ever been so parched? Have I Am I talking to anybody that has been through dry and weird seasons that you just had to go to God and say, God, I'm thirsty. I need you. I want you. And if you don't do this, then nobody can get it done. Father, forgive them. Mother, behold, thy son, this day you shall be with me in paradise. But let me pause for a minute. Let me stop doing life for everybody else for a second. And God, help me out. It's me. It's me. It's me, oh Lord. I'm thirsty. And sometime in life, you have to take time out to see about you. Sometimes. Effective ministry is when you know when you need to be ministered to. Because it's hard to help others when you dehydrated. It's hard to help others when you're trying to quench other people's thirst and you're thirsty yourself. Every now and then, you need to back up and take a break. I remember, I remember, this is a true story, but please hear me in the spirit that I'm giving it. I remember... Uh, when I was in my former context, this young man came to me talking about how frustrated he was and how mad at the world he was and how he hated everybody at the church because nobody at the church was treating him right. And this young man uh, was in training to be a deacon, by the way. And, and I said, uh, I said, uh, when the last time you had a vacation? He says, man, uh, I've been knowing you for about five years and I don't think I ever had a vacation since I've known you. He says, as a matter of fact, I ain't missed church in about three years. I said, do me a favor. Miss church next week. Don't come to church for like three weeks. You go somewhere, get your brain together because you're thirsty right now. And your thirst and your dehydration is calling you to lash out on people that ain't even lashing out at you. Because sometimes, if you're anything like me, Thirst and hunger makes you irritable. Okay, you ain't never been hangry before. You, you, you ain't never been mad at the world until you had a snicker. Th th that's kind of how he was. So sometimes you got to back up and cease doing life for everybody else to make sure you are not dehydrated. It's personal. It's personal. 
It's so personal that sometimes you have to make up in your mind that just because you are available don't mean you are accessible. Or let's flip that around. Just because you are accessible don't mean you are available. That sometimes just because you know where I live, don't pull. I'm just stopping by the house because I was in a neighborhood because God led me to you for you to pray for me. No, you're going to get your feelings hurt when you do this. That just because I'm accessible don't mean I'm available because I'm quenching my own thirst right now. It's personal. Why don't you point to yourself and say it's personal. I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. This is not me rejecting beloved community. This don't me trying to do life in Christianity by myself. But I'm no good to you if I'm thirsty myself. It's personal. But not only is it personal, number two, it's practical. Because Jesus was not only the son of God, he was the son of man. Which means this whole episode exposes the dual nature of God or Jesus. He is what some scholars call the God-man. Theanthropos. In other words, when the word became flesh, he became man, something he had never been without ceasing being who he always was. He became man, but never stopped being God. He became like me so he could understand me. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Here is the shout, if it shout you like it shouted me. He understands me. That when I'm thirsty, he knows what thirst feels like. He knows what it feels like to invest in people and when you need them, they are nowhere to be found. He knows what it's like to go to your own and your own receives you not. He knows how it feels for birds to have nests and, 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 no, and he had nowhere to lay his head. He knows what it's like to be between a rock and a hard place and when your prayer partners won't pray for you. He understands me. This Jesus flesh knows what it's like to be thirsty. He's bleeding, he's thirsty, he's hurting, and he's hanging. So God went out of God's way to be practical, practical because God knew we couldn't climb all the way up to him. So since we could not climb all the way up to God, God came all the way down to us. And this is why you shouldn't be all stuck up and arrogant and untouchable. Because if you ain't got to jump up to God to reach God, why you make people think they got to jump up to you just to reach you? But our attitudes ought to be the same access I got to God. It's the same access you have for God. Are you feeling me here? If God can come down to your level, how much more practical should you be to come down to somebody else's level? I didn't say that right because you ain't got to come down to nobody's level and nobody has to come down to your level because I don't care if you are doctor, preacher, pastor, deacon, nobody don't have to come to your level because all of us are on the same level. There is not a friend that's so high and holy, but there's also not a friend so meek and lowly. And the ground at the foot of the cross is all level ground. So from the doctor to the pauper, we can worship together. From the preacher to the homeless, we can all worship together. Because if God can humble God's self, 
Surely you and I can humble ourselves. I double dog dare you to look back over your life and think things over. And when people thought you had it together and you tried to make them think you had it together, but you really didn't know where your next meal was coming from, but you was coming to church all suited and booted, looking like you got money you ain't already got, and then had the audacity and the temerity to make people think they had to come up to your level when they don't know that you was in the same shape they're in. So we all ought to rejoice and be exceedingly glad because God, who came down to us, so we wouldn't have to jump up to God. It's the same God that let us look in the doctor's eye, the president's eye, and whoever eye we find ourselves in proximity to. That's a quote from a guy named Jay-Z. He says, the baddest chick in the game is wearing my chain. And I remember uh, when I saw... Uh, Jay-Z, for the first time, you know, I can't remember the video, but he had on a hood and two big pants and a t-shirt down to his knees. You know, they don't wear clothes like that too much no more. And then the next time I saw Jay-Z, he gonna have on a three-piece suit and nice cufflinks with a spread collar tie with some, with some red bottoms on. I said, go ahead, Jay-Z. Uh, Jay-Z don't dress in the hood and the two big pants no more. He used to. Uh, every now and then you'll see him like that. But for the most part, Jay-Z is looking like the money he got. Uh, but even when Jay-Z had money or was getting money, uh, he didn't dress uh, like where he could be. He dressed so he could identify with his target audience. So he knew his target audience could not, uh, could not relate to the three-piece suit. He knew his target audience couldn't relate to the flashy cufflinks. He knew his target audience probably couldn't afford red bottoms. So he says, instead of trying to look like I'm high and uppity, let me dress like them so they can identify with me. And we do not have a high priest. And he became obedient to death, even to a death of a cross because he thought it not robbery to be equal with God but he made himself a no reputation and came in the likeness of man aren't you glad that Dr. Simmons Jesus is what God looked like in public that if you want to know what God looked like look how Jesus walked Look how Jesus talked. Look how Jesus lived. And look how Jesus gave. It was, it was practical. It was personal. It was practical. But finally, it was purposeful. I always struggle with with sermons like this, I almost identify with Dr. Renita Weems. She says, every time I sit down, the first thing I think is, Lord, I hope I got that right. Uh, but it's purposeful. Jesus was thirsty. Hope I say this right. Jesus was thirsty on purpose. Text says that the scripture might be fulfilled. The thirstiness of the son uh, was in the father's foreknowledge all alone. The betrayal and the thirst didn't take God off guard. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. I've tr I worked for a while to find it. In. This thirst didn't take God off guard. Do I have any Bible readers? Because the betrayal by his family and friends was already prophesied in Psalm 41. Being forsaken by his disciples was prophesied in Psalm 31. 
the silence before his judges was prophesied in Isaiah 53. The numbering of the transgressors was prophesied in Isaiah 53 and 12. Being crucified was in Psalm 22, 16. The mockery of the spectators, Psalm 109, 25. The gambling for his garments, Psalm 22, 18. The prayer for his enemies, Isaiah 53 and 12. Being forsaken or feeling forsaken by God, Psalm 22 and 1. Being thirsty, Psalm 69, 21. The yielding of his spirit into the Father's hand, Psalm 31 and 5. His bone not being broken, Psalm 34 and 20. The burial in a rich man's tomb, Isaiah 53 and 9. So scripture had foretold all of these occurrences before they came to pass. So all of this happened on purpose with God's supervision because he had an ultimate plan for his child and for his children. Was I talking too fast? That this did not take God off guard because God already had a purpose for his child and for his children. I'm talking way too, y'all know I'm slow in country. I grew up in Chattanooga, Tennessee, so I can barely talk. So please listen to me carefully. This did not take God off guard because God already had a plan for his child, his son, and for his sons and daughters. So what his son teaches us is that we miss the lesson of Christ when we regulate or uh, or we capsulize or make so minute the gospel of Christ to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That the gospel is incomplete if your idea of the gospel is just the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's an incomplete gospel. But the gospel ain't just how he died and how he got up. The gospel is about how he lived and why they killed him and that his death is the ultimate sign of resistance to empire and that his resurrection was showing them that you can you don't take my life I lie it down and if I lie it down I got the power to pick it back up again so you can't kill a revolutionary because my daddy had it in plan for the whole entire time so you think you going under and you think you about to drown and you think you going to throw in a towel and you think life can't get no worse and you think that you're going to give up. But God wants me to tell you, child of God, that your Savior's life is not a picture of a successful life. But your Savior's life is a picture of how to handle life, not when I'm successful. But Christ's life is teaching us how to handle life when life gets stressful. I know what to do when I'm successful, praise God. I know what to do when I'm happy, give God the glory. I know what I'm supposed to do when I got money in a pocket, thank God for it. But how do I handle life when I'm broke, busted, and disgusted? How do I handle life when I, my parents don't even got room for a hotel? How do I handle life when I was born in a feeding trough? How do I handle life when foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but I ain't got nowhere to lay my head? How do I handle life when I die at 33 and a half years old by the hands of the state? How do I handle life when I'm hanging and the people I pour to run away from me? That when life gets stressful and life crucifies you, the life of Christ teaches us that you're going to be thirsty, you're going to be hanging, and you're going to be hurting. But if you kill me, just give me about uh, 48 hours or so. Give me, about, give me about 72 hours and I will show you that you can knock me down, but you can't knock me out. Here is, here is the life of Christ. I'm out here. I got a plane to catch in a few minutes. Here, here, is, here is the life of Christ. It's like, uh, I don't know the name of it. It's almost like them, uh, them frozen cups. We call them something different all over the country. Some call them frozen pops. Some call them frozens. 
Uh, but this is that thing, that big old funny looking egg shaped thing. Some of it had a clown face. Y'all remember that? And it kind of did this. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Kind of. And you hit it. Y'all know that? Oh, y'all, y'all always had money. Y'all didn't play with stuff like that. Weeble, wobble. Yeah, yeah. I knew y'all was country. Weeble, wobble, wobble. But it wouldn't fall down. Y'all remember that? And you would hit it, and it would like just bounce all up. And you would lay on it and come off of it. It just part right. Y'all remember that thing? And you would kick it across the room. It never landed on his head. It always landed right side up. And it always landed right side up because how it was designed. It wasn't designed to turn over. It was designed to land upright. And the reason you keep on landing the way you landing, you crying, but you're landing, though. You're hurting, but you're landing, though. You don't feel good all the time, but you keep landing. You know why? It's because you ain't designed to fall on your head. And so one day I was never a bad child. I was, oh, I sincerely, I was sincerely always a good child, sincerely. I was always sneaky but good. And, uh, and so uh, one day I had company because I didn't go over people's houses. I want you to come to my house. And when I went to your house, when it got dark, I cried to go home because I didn't want to spend a night. Uh, that, I was just spoiled like that. And uh, so I had company. Uh, it was a guy who lived in my hood named Moishe Gustus. Moishe Gustus is a great guy. But Moishe, when he was young, boy, he was hell on wheels. And so I wanted to get to the bottom of what's going on in this Weeba Wobble. I got it. I can cut it open and put it on Moishe. Because Moishe is bad, right? Uh, So when I go home, hopefully, when Moishe go home, hopefully mom won't call this mama and say he tore up the toy. Hopefully she'll just believe me and say he can't come over no more. Uh, So I... (laughs) I punched a hole in it, and guess what I find out about that Weeble Wobble? Not only was it designed a certain type of way, but it had like a weight at the bottom of it. It had like something on the inside. I like how that sounds. It had this weight on the inside. It had this substance on the inside that aided the design to keep it right side up. And so not only did it always land right side up because of the design, but it always landed right side up because what was in it. It it was something within that was holding the rain. And it was something within that was banishing pain. It was something within that I just could not explain. But all that I know is that it was something within. It was, it, was, it was something that made his love his enemy and made it love its friend and wouldn't let it be ashamed to tell the world that it's been gone, born again. What, what is this that makes me feel so good inside? What is this that makes me want to run when ain't nobody chasing me and cry when it ain't nobody bothering me? It's the Holy Ghost down on the inside that allows me to take the world's pain and punishment and keep on landing right. Anybody got the Holy Ghost? I grew up Baptist, 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 and we didn't say Holy Ghost. We said Holy Spirit because ghost was a little spooky, but I like how ghost sound. Anybody got the Holy Ghost? The only way you here today is because you got the Holy Ghost. You, you got something down on the inside of you that's working on the outside of you. It don't keep you from hurting, but it keeps you from throwing in the towel. Man, I can't wait. I can't wait. Uh, I can't wait. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm seeing my daddy tomorrow. I can't wait to see my daddy. Because... Uh, Cause, uh, dang, I done got the talking. I didn't want Jill to know this, but uh, he hit the other day. He gonna give me some money, so 
So um, now, true story. He told me that he hit, and so I'm going to Nashville when I leave here because I got to teach a class at American Baptist College in the morning. And uh, but the first stop I make, Dad told me I played your birthday and it went down. Ooh, y'all clapping. All y'all going to hell. All y'all going to hell, boy, I tell you. <laughs> and I can't wait to go see my daddy because my daddy going to go into his pocket. Dad don't believe in putting his money in banks. Dad go, no, maybe I shouldn't be telling all y'all that. And so dad going to go in his pocket and uh, he going to give me some money and we going to reminisce. We going to reminisce for about 10 minutes because dad like me. He don't like staying nowhere long. He going to say, son, I'm so happy to see you and Man, I'm so glad I could lay eyes on you. He's going to reach in his pocket. And we're going to talk for five minutes. He's going to say, all right, how long are you going to be here? Come by tomorrow. <laughs> that's one of my favorite, uh, that's one of my favorite uh, memories of dad. I, that, you know, dad just yawned and he talks to me a while and he says, okay, uh, go on to the crib. But I got one more memory. I got one more memory. Y'all got one more time for one more illustration. Uh, uh, my, my favorite cartoon growing up was Popeye the Sailor Man. Y'all remember, they, they don't do cartoons. That's how I know I'm old, because I'm always talking about what is good TV and what is good music. You officially old when you say stuff like they don't make music like they used to make music. Uh, they don't make cartoons like they used to make cartoons. And Popeye the Sailor Man came on every day. I got home from school around 4.30, so I miss uh, uh, Batman, but I used to always catch Popeye. Uh, and Papa uh, was in love with this. No, everybody got their tight, right? And uh, he was in love uh, with olive oil. But it was a, also a guy named Brutus. Uh, he had eyes uh, for olive oil as well. And Brutus was Popeye's antagonist. Every show. Brutus used to put Popeye in a fence. He would tie Popeye down at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, he, would, he would put Popeye in a dungeon. Uh, he would tape Popeye's mouth up and tie his hands up. Uh, but I don't care what happened, Popeye used to always get free. Because somewhere, whether at the bottom of the ocean or in a dungeon, Spinach happened to be some, somewhere around. And somehow, he would always get to the spinach. And I used to ask my daddy in his cynical way, how in the world does Popeye get spinach, no matter what Popeye had? And my dad, with his Salem 100 and his cheap vodka, would look at me and say, uh, son, you didn't know? I said, no. He's like, Popeye gets out every week the same way he's going to get out next week. How is that? He says, because it's written in the script. <laughs> Y'all didn't come to half church. Good evening. May the Lord bless you real good. The reason why Jesus got out is the same way you're going to get out. It's written in the script. That he was wounded for my transgressions. I wish I could hoop. It go good right here. He was wounded for my transgressions. And he was bruised for my iniquities. And by his stripes, I am here. It's written in the script. That I've been young, now I'm old. But I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Nor his seed begging for bread. It's written in the script that my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory is written in the script that if I seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness all these things shall be added so I don't know where I don't know when I don't know how but I can tell you why is written in the script. Man, y'all, I can't have church by myself. I'm going to go home. Come on, put your hands together and give the Lord a head clap of praise. Obey your thirst. Don't deny it. It's personal sometimes. It's personal. It's personal. 
but it helps us be practical. Because sometimes we get saved and get real spooky. Have you met one of the spooky saints? How you doing? Hey, da, da, ba, ba. how you doing? But it's also purposeful. Don't waste your thirst. Because you're going to get thirsty again. Learn from it. And watch God get you out every single time. Hope you're watching, Dad. See you in a minute. I thirst. Put your hands together. Give God a head clap of prayer. Come on, standing all over the building. Standing all over the building. This is what we call in our faith tradition, uh, the doors of the church are open. Uh, the doors of the church are open. Doors of church are open. I meant to say this the other night, Lily. Um, this is an invitation for those on the outside to come in. Uh, this is a reassurance that this is a loving space and place where people can come and be loved and love. This is a place that people's thirst are not held against them. I desire this to be a place where people can't quite put their finger on it, but they don't even know if they all the way believe, but they feel like they belong. I think that's what kingdom look like. Come on, sister. I think that's what, I think that's what kingdom looks like. Yeah. But the doors of the church being open is not just so those who are on the outside can come in. But probably even more important is when we give the benediction, it's a door we can walk out of. That we don't only expect those on the outside to come in, but those of us on the inside will go out. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. This, is, this is symbolism of not only are you welcome, but it's symbolism that we'll go where you are. Yeah. So if you want to love and be loved, this is an invitation, not just an invitation from membership. This is an invitation to love. We want to love you. And we want you to love us. Will you come? If you're on, if you're online, you can go to the e-membership. And before this day is over, somebody will contact you. They are monitoring that page even right now. Will you come? Sing y'all through it all. Through it all, I've learned. I've learned to depend upon His word. Yeah, through it all, will you come? Through it all, through it all, through it all, I've learned. I've learned to trust in Jesus.
upon his word. trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God through trust in about to go we're about to go but I just really believe in the power and the energy of community can y'all stretch your hands down here to my to our dear sister the attack is real the emotions are complex but I believe we serve a God that can sift through all that and go to that place that has not been exposed to other human personalities, but we know and God know. So in your own way, pray for her healing, that her soul will not lose faith in God. That this process is fresh and new. 
circumstances didn't allow us to be in the places and spaces like we desired. But God beat us there even when we could not make it. Whatever your faith, whether you pray in the Holy Ghost or pray silently, pray for my sister. One of us can chase a thousand, but two of us can chase ten thousand. In the name of Jesus, we pray for my sister. In the name of Jesus, we pray for her heart and her healing. We pray for her family. And God, we know you can do it for her because you did it for us. So where she lacks faith, we connect our faith with hers. In the name of Jesus. We declare it done and it is so in Jesus' name. In that name that makes demons tremble in Jesus' name. In that name that gives us joy and sorrow and hope for tomorrow in the name of Jesus. In that name that calms our fears and dries our tears in the name of Jesus. God as a community of faith, we come to you about somebody else's problem. Let her know that she is so special to you that you changed the whole program because you know she would be here. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And the people of God put their hands together and gave God praise. Come on, people of God. Let's thank God for Ann's healing. In the name of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Remain standing. <sighs> Bless her heart. Bless her heart. Bless her heart. Bless her heart. Wow. we uh, as we prepare to leave uh, keep the family of uh, <laughs> of Annie McCray uh, Annie McCray your prayers her funeral services will be here next Monday uh, so please keep your eyes and ears open uh, for more details I think it's at one o'clock yeah, one o'clock p.m. this next Monday next Monday uh, her daughter Jackie's here Hey, make it see. You the one I talk to. All right, all right. Glad you're here. Uh, we're gonna keep in all our families who are grief and uh, in bereavement. Uh, Pastor Montel Richardson, who pastors in Campbellsville, Kentucky, called me up yesterday and says, "Man, can you just uh, pray for me? It's a weird season. Uh, just a weird season, feel like, doesn't it? Uh, but we serve a God who is able. We serve a God who is able. Amen. Amen." Let us go before the Lord in prayer. God, how we love you and how we thank you, how we appreciate you for your love and your kindness, which is better than life. We thank you for this worship experience. We thank you for showing up as only you can. We pray now for my brother. We pray now for my sister that you would touch them at their deepest point of need. We won't leave here like we came. In Jesus' name. And we decree and declare it done. Now may the love of God and the justice of God and the sweet communion of God's spirit.
continue to rest with us, rule with us, and abide with us, yea, now and forevermore. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and the people of God said, have a great week.